And uh, let me ask you to reach for a Bible and to turn to page 819, page 819, where you'll find Matthew chapter 13. As you do that, if we've not met, my name is Paul. I'm the senior minister here. It's a joy to be able to welcome you, and especially if you're going to be around in town over the next little while. We'd love the chance to get to know you. Do please, as John says, stick around at the end uh, if you possibly can. We've been working our way through uh, Matthew 13 the last little while. I'm going to pray, and then we'll start reading from verse 31 in a moment. We want to um, praise you, Almighty God, for your presence with us by your Spirit. We want to thank you that the same Spirit who inspired these words all those years ago is here now to open our minds, uh, to give us insight into your Word. And we pray too to, to change our wills uh, and our perspective on the universe that we might live in the light of the things that you say to us this morning. So help us, please, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me read then uh, Matthew 13, verses 31 to 35. Jesus put another parable before them, uh, the crowds, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds. But when it's grown, it is larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour till it was all leavened. All these things Jesus said to the crowds in parables. Indeed, he said nothing to them without a parable. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter what was hidden since uh, the foundation of the world. It'd be great if you keep that open. There's also an outline of um, the sermon on the back of the notice sheet as well. And we're going to jump straight in because it's not hard, is it, to work out the point of the parables this morning. The, The mustard seed is the smallest of all of the garden seeds, and yet from those apparently insignificant beginnings it grows dramatically into a tree a yeast leaven doesn't look all that potent at first glance but it has a surprising power to transform and once again Jesus is using these parables as he's been doing all this month if you've been with us to reveal to the crowds around him the the true nature of the kingdom of heaven this is what it's like he's wanting to say And just to deal with those little verses 34 and 35 first, uh, Matthew's saying that in talking to the crowds in parables like this, Jesus is uh, once again fulfilling part of the Old Testament. We often say that um, although the Bible is a a collection of 66 books that was written by dozens of different authors over hundreds of years, it is nevertheless one book with one single message about one main character. I always think of the Old Testament as being like a pre-match build-up to the main event, Jesus. That's the Gospels, the live commentary on his coming, uh, and the analysis, the interpretation of it by the expert eyewitnesses. And then the rest of the New Testament, looking back to understand, to dissect what's happened, and to apply it to our lives. Uh, uh, That's not a, a grid that we place on the Bible, That's a a way that the Bible itself requires us to read it through little statements like this. This happened to fulfill what happened back then. I counted uh, 19 of those in uh, Matthew's gospel alone, those little fulfillments. They cover the birth of Jesus, his childhood, his life, his ministry, his crucifixion. There are dozens more allusions back to the Old Testament uh, in the text of Matthew. In the In total, they think that in the the Gospels, there are over 300 ways in which Jesus is seen to fulfill everything that was predicted hundreds of years in advance, 30 of them, just the last 24 hours of his life. And specifically here, Matthew's saying that what was true of Jesus' life, his death, his resurrection in general, is also true specifically of his teaching ministry and of the fact that he was teaching people in parables. And the quotation comes from Psalm 78, 
where a, a man called Asaph is giving his hearers God's interpretation of the history of Israel. There was a bunch of people there. They knew the events, but they didn't know the meaning. And so Asaph was saying, this is what God says is going on. And that's a great picture of what's happening with these parables. There are crowds around. They've been following Jesus for a while now. Uh, they've seen his miracles. They've heard his wisdom. Like some still in our society, I guess, they're familiar with the facts of Jesus and his ministry. But they haven't yet grasped the meaning. They don't really know what's going on. And so this is... Uh, these parables are Jesus' way of saying to us, I, I don't want you to miss the significance of what is happening. This is God's authoritative. This is his interpretation, explanation of who I am and what I've come to do. And if you just glance on a verse, do you see what happens in verse 36? I think it's really intriguing. Because in verse 36, Jesus then leaves the crowds behind and he goes inside uh, the house. Uh, and as he does so, the crowds then drift off. They go back to their jobs, their social media, and they get on with what they're doing. But at that moment, the disciples come inside the house with him, following him deliberately. And they ask him, can you, can you tell us a bit more about what you've been saying? We want to understand. We want to learn. We want to grow. And that is Matthew's um, gentle way of putting a choice before any of the readers of his gospel, people like us this morning. He's uh, inquiring gently, what, what's our attitude to the things of God this morning? Where's our, where's our heart at when it comes to Jesus and his teaching? What are my, what are my hunger levels like for Jesus' word? Am I just here, happy to be around it a little bit? Or do I really want to learn and grow? Am I going to follow him, as it were, inside the house and seek to learn from him, even this morning, in these next few moments? And if we're going to do that, God has three lessons for us that I put on the sheet. First is the radical growth of the kingdom, the radical growth of the kingdom. So let me read again from verse 31. The kingdom of heaven, said Jesus, is like a grain of mustard seed, that a man took and sowed in his field. It's the smallest of all seeds, but when it's grown, it's larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. Now, if this were a children's talk, I'd have um, scoured the garden centers of Fife and I would be able to hold up for you a mustard seed. I didn't do that. Um, if you're in the front row, you might be able to see it. Those at the back would just have to take my word for it because they're just tiny little things. Uh, if it were a really good children's talk, I would also have sourced a mustard tree from somewhere 10, 12 feet high, and then out of nowhere, someone would emerge carrying it, and we would be able to see the difference between the little mustard seed and the really big uh, tree. You can just imagine it. And we would all become very aware in an instant of the just extraordinary energy and force and potential that was contained within that tiny seed. Now, all through Matthew 13, so far, if you've been here, the, the seed has represented the message of the kingdom that Jesus is proclaiming. But even his most ardent followers at this point in Matthew would have to admit that his message, his arrival, has been pretty weak and ineffective so far. There's been lots of superficial interest in him and uh, for those with eyes to see there's been no doubt of his power his identity his wisdom occasionally people have been amazed at him but there aren't many that are really hungry to learn there aren't many who are going to follow him inside the house i remember hearing a preacher imagine a conversation between jesus and an angel Shortly, I'm not sure if you're allowed to do this, but we're going to do it anyway. Shortly after, um, he'd uh, risen from the dead and ascended to heaven. And he pictured the angel asking Jesus, did you, um, did you fix up everything on earth when you were down there? Uh, has, everything been, has every wrong been righted? Is the kingdom fully established now? And he says, no, I haven't done that yet. 
He says, so what are we talking then? Did, did everyone in Israel become a disciple? Is that the foundation that we're going from? He says, no, not, not really. What about outside of Israel? Are there millions now that are praising your name? He says, no, not, there's not that many. So eventually the angel's like, well, so how many are we talking about then? And he says, well, there's maybe 11 men of mixed ability and then some truly devoted women. Um, around 30 AD, uh, Jesus of Nazareth was executed as a common criminal. He was alone. He was almost entirely deserted by those who claimed to follow him. From the cross, it looked, we often say, don't we, as though his mission lay in tatters. His kingdom, just like a tiny mustard seed. His message appeared weak and ineffective. But the parable is saying, let's not be fooled by appearances. The power, the potential for growth in the kingdom is astonishing. And we know, with the benefit of hindsight, how the story went from there. Jesus didn't stay dead. He conquered the grave. He appeared to his disciples. Soon there were about 120 um, of them gathering together. Six weeks later, 3,000 were added to their number in a single day. Gradually, if you read on in the book of Acts, you see the word of God spreading, multiplying, not just in Jerusalem, but then in Judea and Samaria and all the way to the ends of the earth. There's things that could derail it, tension, compromise within the church, but still the word continues to spread and grow. There's persecution and, and opposition from outside the church and still the word continues to spread and to grow. Uh, historians reckon by AD 49, the message of Jesus had reached the shores of uh, India. By AD 61, it was in China. And so it continued to spread and to grow. Chrysostom in the fourth century, the power of gospel preaching has subdued the whole world from that one tiny seed. So I don't think you need to be a, a Christian this morning to recognize the truth of what Jesus is saying. Imagine we could zoom back in time and try and tell the, the first hearers of this parable that 2,000 years later around the world, there would be one and a half billion or so people who at least claim to know Jesus, the one who'd been talking to them, and to live under his rule. Or imagine you could tell them that the things that Jesus was saying and doing and their interpretation would be written down in the New Testament. And that 2,000 years on, it would have been translated completely into 5,000 of the 6,500 languages that there are in the world. I don't know if they would have believed you. But we're being told the word of the kingdom, the kingdom of God is that powerful and mighty. And so the parable's here to, to grow our confidence, and we need it uh, in our own generation in the West. As we look around our society, I don't think we immediately think that the message of Jesus looks really powerful and mighty. We're excited when some churches are planted. We're excited when a few people become Christians. They're wonderful things. But the, the word of the gospel hardly looks like some unstoppable force in 2023 in Scotland. You hear stories of dramatic church growth in other parts of the world, and at least a bit of us thinks, well, it couldn't happen here. And if you ask, well, whose message is it that does seem to have power in our day? Who's, who's getting real traction with the things that they're saying to us? And you'd say it would be the, the climate action lobby, wouldn't you? You'd say it would be those uh, who campaign the identity pressure groups that seem to be dominating and filling our headlines, our media, our classrooms with everything that they're saying. It's good for us to be reminded that the word of the gospel, the seed, contains within it the same extraordinary dynamism that it's always had so that we can not only believe it in our hearts with full faith and confidence, but then proclaim it with confidence in the world. The whole of Matthew is written to encourage us to go and make disciples of all nations. One writer, um, I'm going to tweak his words slightly, but he put it this way, 
pressure groups and ideologies almost always seem stronger than the church. Pressure groups and ideologies fly, the church limps. But then pressure groups and ideologies die, and the church limps on. Stick with Jesus and his word. That's our first point, the radical growth of the kingdom. Second is the hidden power of the kingdom from verse 33. This time he told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour till it was all leavened. And if the, the first parable was about the kingdom's dramatic growth, um, the second is about its surprising power to transform. And if you've um, ever baked your own bread, you've got a head start. Um, we had a bread maker once. I've probably told some of you this before. Um, when we first got it, I didn't know a lot about baking. Um, I was pretty sure there was a typo in the ingredients because it said just one teaspoon, I think it was, if that, of yeast would be needed. I thought that must be a mistake. I wanted to tip in the whole pot. My sous chef uh, set me right. And uh, sure enough, by the morning, the yeast had worked its way through the whole batch of dough, and we got to wake up to that beautiful smell of freshly baked bread. On one occasion, I forgot to put the yeast in. Uh, there followed a culinary horror show. I have no idea what Paul Hollywood would have made of it. But again, Jesus' point is obvious, isn't it? When that yeast is first hidden in the flour, you barely even know it's there. And yet it has the most astonishing power. And what it produces is beyond what you'd imagine. And Jesus is saying that the kingdom of heaven is, is like that. That its, its potential for good won't always be obvious at first. That it will be hidden. That its results won't always be instant. They, they will be hidden. But that it has an incredible power to change. Uh, just on, on a, a personal level for us individually, it happens when God chooses in his grace to reveal the secrets of the kingdom of heaven to us. As someone becomes a Christian, God plants the, the word of his son in our hearts. And at first, the word's hidden. You don't look any different on the outside, do you? Often you don't feel very different for very long. Uh, often your life doesn't change instantly. But then bit by bit, that seed gets to work, and over time, the change is dramatic. And for some, it, it's dramatic from day one, isn't it? The change is obvious and immediate. Others, it happens at a, at a deeper level. It's about our, our desires, our attitudes, our grudges, our motivations, our pride. But that change is inevitable for anyone sitting under the word of God with a receptive heart. Uh, it doesn't always happen as quickly as we'd like it to in us or in the people we live with, but change is inevitable. And the believer then will be able to look at their life and say with John Newton, I know I'm not what I ought to be. I'm not what I want to be. I'm not what I will be one day. But by the grace of God, I'm not what I once was. And wonderfully, God hasn't finished with us yet. The yeast still at work, changing us. But I think Jesus' primary point here probably is an individual, but, but a bit broader, global, corporate. Um, we've said already the impact of Jesus' ministry on the, the geopolitical world of his day was pretty small in truth. In the Old Testament, God had promised to his people a glorious kingdom of joy and peace. There was going to be a, a new society in which all of the nations of the world would stop fighting each other and they would be united in their thirst to know God. And Jesus was here saying, the kingdom has come. But all that had been promised didn't seem to have arrived just yet. Some of even Jesus' closest disciples were unsure. Is he really the forever king that we've been waiting for? Is the kingdom really here? John the Baptist asked that question himself at the start of chapter 11. The, the parable of the yeast, I think, therefore, is, is here to slow down our expectations a bit. Jesus was saying, I, I am the king. The kingdom is here. 
but right now it's hidden. It won't be like that forever. It will do its work. All of the promises will be fulfilled, but right now it's still hidden. Its work is often imperceptible to start with, but again, there's an inevitability. And once again, it's a point that's been proven by history. And the sociologist Alvin Schmidt wrote a, a book called How Christianity Changed the World. Uh, he did similar work to what Tom Holland's been doing uh, as well. His conclusion is that the person and teaching of Jesus had a, a history-changing impact on the Western world especially. He says, if Christ had never been born, to speak of Western civilization would be incomprehensible. Uh, that is not because the church saw its mission as trying to change the political structures and institutions of the day. They really didn't. They wanted to love Jesus, they wanted to love their neighbor, and they wanted to make disciples of all nations. But as with the, the yeast, the power of their kingdom lives could not be contained. This is his conclusion. The early Christians did not set out to change the world but the world was affected as a byproduct of the believers' transformed lives. But it was changed. Uh, you could point to a similar transformation in our own lands after the great evangelical awakening of the 18th, 19th century. There was preaching from men like Wesley and Whitfield. There were endeavors from people like Shaftesbury, Wilberforce, Newton. A huge part of the country was changed. Such is the power of the kingdom. It's not equally obvious in every place and at every stage of church history, but as you look around the world, you'll see it still happening. I remember chatting to a pastor not a million miles from here who was, um, his congregation were trying to plant a new church in a, into a deprived community. And he said, much to their surprise, the local council had been wonderfully supportive because they realized that the church was going to be such a force for good in that community. Everyone else was trying to get out, and here were people moving in to love their neighbors and to tell them about the hope of eternal life. And the point is that the message of the kingdom is no less powerful than it ever has been. The, the kingdom of Jesus is, is rarely front-page news, you rarely hear the teaching of Jesus on the media. It rarely advances at the pace of a dramatic revolution. Wonderfully, it does sometimes. But still, it has this hidden power to change the world. One life, one soul, one community at a time. Um, I think that the, our parables have one final lesson. I think it's a little bit uh, cheeky or subversive in some ways. The final vindication of the king. The final vindication of the king. And just to answer verse 32 once more, Jesus says of the mustard seed, it's the smallest of all seeds, but when it's grown, it's larger than all the garden plants. It becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. Uh, and to those uh, Jews in the crowd who'd read their Old Testament, they would be thinking, hang on, this isn't the first time in the Bible that a kingdom has been compared to a tree, not even to a tree that's so large that birds can come and nest in its branches. They'd be thinking, that happened back in Daniel 4. Uh, the tree was an image of the, the mighty kingdom of Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. In Ezekiel, it was an image of Pharaoh's Egypt, as uh, he looked back on the day. And so in choosing to use this image of a tree to describe his own kingdom, Jesus is deliberately saying, you know you've heard about mighty human empires in the past? There's a new king in town with a new kingdom, and I am he. And the thing that makes it a little bit cheeky, a little bit subversive, political even, is that as he's speaking... He's standing within the bounds of the Roman Empire. And yet he's still willing to say, I know that my kingdom doesn't look very big today, just a mustard seed. I know that it doesn't seem very powerful, it's hidden. But don't be fooled, because the seed is going to grow, and it's going to transform more and more people one at a time, until you get to a point where people from every nation will have come 
and nested in its branches and enjoyed its protection and its food and its shade. And what's more, says Jesus, my kingdom is never going to be chopped down. Because it's not just an earthly kingdom. It's the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God himself. This may be going too far. There's, um, there's, I think there's one more little dimension to this. If you know those, um, the stories from the Old Testament, you'd know that the, the kingdoms of, of Egypt and Babylon had a lot in common. Uh, they were both mighty, both very successful kind of global empires of the day. They were also ruled by enormously arrogant men who set themselves up in direct opposition to God. So Pharaoh famously, um, God said, let my people go so that they can worship me in the desert. And you'll know that Pharaoh said no. God said it again, let my people go. And Pharaoh said no. Nebuchadnezzar um, stood on the famously one evening on the, the top of his palace roof, looked out over everything that he had he'd built and praised himself for his own mighty power and the glory of his majesty, giving no glory at all to God. So you've got two men, both explicit enemies of God, but then their stories end very differently. Uh, Pharaoh, sadly, never learned his lesson. He continued to harden his heart against God, we're told. His armies ended up perishing in the waters of the Red Sea. Nebuchadnezzar, on the other hand, after a, a period of painful humbling, came to his senses and he realized the God he was dealing with. And then he wrote a, a letter to all of the peoples of the world. You could do that if you were Nebuchadnezzar. And he wanted to tell them about the God that he'd come to know. And this is what he said. God's dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? And here in Matthew 13, Jesus saying, I am that mighty God. And that eternal kingdom of which Nebuchadnezzar spoke is mine. And it's growing as I teach my word and people repent and believe and come under my rule. And that means that rulers of the world, means that peoples of the world are left with a choice. Does one continue to defy God in the way that Pharaoh did and so share his fate? Or do they acknowledge Jesus as the king of an eternal, a universal kingdom and so receive his love and be welcomed into his kingdom and given a place in it, and even a share in his rule. What a wonderful privilege that is. So the parable is another reminder, the real power in the universe doesn't belong to the Caesars of Rome or the Pharaohs of Egypt. It doesn't belong to the Shahs of the Ottoman Empire or the kings of, and queens of Britain or the presidents of America or China or Russia. It doesn't belong to the gurus of capitalism or to the arrogant princes of secularism and wokery. It belongs to Jesus Christ and to him alone. And that is the Jesus who loved us and died for us. And so we can end today by praising him for giving to us, if we know him, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom, bringing us under his protection uh, feeding us, giving us his love, strengthening us by his spirit as we wait for the day when all of his promises are fulfilled. We should end by saying to him be glory as the mighty and eternal king, the Lord of all, now and forever. Should we pray? Our Father, we confess that our take on the world is often informed by what we can see, uh, by the things we hear in our media, by the things we can touch, and not by the truth of your word. And so thank you for reminding us or teaching us afresh this morning 
of the amazing kingdom of heaven that the Lord Jesus um, initiated, inaugurated in his own person, that spreads and grows as people receive his word and believe in him, and that one day will finally be consummated in a new heavens and a new earth. We want to praise you for its power to transform individual lives. We pray, please change us, almighty God, to make us more the people we should be. Thank you for its power to change communities. Thank you for the way it's done that. Even in these lands in the past, we long that it might happen again. But above all, we pray that you would fill us with confidence in Jesus and his truth, that we might believe it, that we might live it, and that we might declare it to the people of this town and right around the world while we wait for the day when we see it in all of its glory. And so to him be the glory, now and forever. Amen. We're going to close 